So it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce Cliff Saren. Many of you know him. I'm not going to give you all of his illustrious background because I'd like to give him time to talk. What I would like to say is Cliff is this really unique individual. And for those of you that have seen the movie Fierce Grace, this is a movie about Ram Dass, I think Cliff really embodies this fierce grace because he's got this, this teddy bear grace about him, yet is extremely fierce, both with his science and with his, um, his love of the practice. So you're really in for a treat today. Please welcome Cliff Saren. That's beautiful. You know just what to say. It's really an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be here and to really feel as we are still basking in the glow and inspiration of Rhonda's talk, the depth of community and refuge we find in each other and the call to open arms that we are faced with uh, at this historical moment. So I have a talk with a title. Can we have the PowerPoint? <laughs> and you know, under ordinary circumstances, that would be a reasonable talk and title. But for me, the real core motivating question why I'm doing this work with my colleagues, I thought for a second we were in India and that was a power outage, <laughs> is how can we engage with and compassionately respond to our own suffering and the suffering of the world as it comes to us. And this week, there are elements of that suffering that we can no longer be blind to, that I know I personally have been blind to. So can we have the PowerPoint and probably keep the PowerPoint on? Thank you. This is a picture published in Wednesday's New York Times, accompanying an interesting op-ed piece. This is a group called the Mesa Deplorables. So we have an identity politics that arose from a moral judgment, seceding from the Republican Party to do everything they can do to elect Donald Trump. When I see a bunch of white people with this many flags, I typically get very uneasy because I think they uh, stand in for make America white and Christian. But I had another view of this photo this week, and I thought of prayer flag, and I thought of how little I actually know of the minds and hearts of these individuals who are not part of my daily life. This was in an op-ed piece by Michael Lerner, a rabbi in Berkeley, who writes as the principal investigator on a study of the middle class for the National Institute of Mental Health, I found that working people's stress is often intensified by shame at their failure to make it in what they are taught and believe is a meritocracy. This is not a meritocracy. Democrats need to become as conscious and articulate about the suffering caused by classism, by classism, classism as we are about other forms of suffering. So now we continue with the program already in progress. Rhonda talked about uh, this slide. <laughs> and it's really quite remarkable. And it also is the definition of a bubble. Because are we going to be here in five years and we're going to have, you know, this can just exponentially go up at some point. There will be some kind of plateau. So accompanying the promulgation of research on mindfulness in the world, how many of you have checked out your new iOS 10 health app icon. And if you upgraded your operating system, you might notice that mindfulness is now part of iOS 10. 
and in, that's 294 million deployed iPhones. And of course, mine says no data. <laughs> but you can log, if you go to these participating business partner apps, you can log the minutes that you're mindful. You know about this article? A reporter contacted me because we showed in our intensive three-month full-time retreat that visual acuity, your visual perceptual threshold improves in three months of full-time focused attention meditation. Stockbrokers are eating up that finding because they want to meditate to improve how they get information on all the screens they see. It's a kind of internal high-frequency trading. This is quite poignant at this moment. <laughs> May a little of this move up the food chain. And then best dressed monk clothes for the mindful man. <laughs> this was a bunch of guys who went to Kathmandu and Kashmir in search of enlightenment and came back with a bunch of wool. <laughs> All right. And we have this technological device, a very interesting piece of hardware that actually does a good job of recording brain waves from over frontal regions as well as muscle tension over frontal muscles. And it purports, because of its marketing, to tell you when your mind is wandering. But it may be a disincentive for you to know yourself if your mind is wandering, not that it actually is veridical scientifically. It's been used. This is a woman in British Columbia who did a research project. She went to Nepal. You know, when, we, when Richie and I went, we had to drag 1,500 pounds of equipment it's a lot easier now, but the notion that you can put on uh, an electro, a couple of electrodes and sort of extract out, sort of crank out this Tibetan Buddhist wisdom in the squiggles, it's just a remarkable conflagration of worldviews not connecting. And of course, we can look at the frontalis muscle tension. Matthew mentioned all these programs regarding mindfulness at work. At the Summer Institute of Mind and Life last summer, the focus was on the importance of context. The science, this is from David McMahon at Franklin and Marshall. The scientific study of contemplative practices often neglects the role of cultural, historical, social, political, and religious and ethical context isolating these practices from these contexts for the sake of scientific study may inevitably distort how they actually work in people's lives. We cannot make sense of contemplative practices in isolation from these contexts. They are inextricably systematically intertwined. David talks about a social imaginary where one begins with a cosmological worldview that traces all the way down from impacts of institutions at large scale, cultural norms, beliefs, ethics, goals, and values. You can imagine the social imaginary is quite different for these two individuals. When we think about research on contemplative practice, I think that there are importantly two kinds of questions that motivate a lot of research. The first is, what do people do when they meditate? This is a 70-odd-year-old psychophysiological research quest. And I'm going to posit that it's almost an unanswerable question. But a lot of time and energy has gone into trying to answer it. In addition to vast differences in meditation techniques, individuals differ in their understanding of meditation instructions. 
in their capacity to implement those instructions, in their motivation and attitude toward practice, in the physical circumstances of practice, what they learn from practice and when they learn it. There are physiological changes associated with just sitting on your tuchis. And those of you who are not Jewish or don't know Yiddish, that means your derriere, your bum, your butt. This is courtesy of a conversation with Paul Grossman many years ago. But we can ask, what do people do differently? Because they have meditated. There are experimental approaches to evaluate effects of training. But what and how to measure? Scientific psychology didn't evolve with a sort of distal point of being able to measure things that purport to show you insights into the nature of your own mind. We need qualitative data to add to our quantitative data. And of course, these two questions interact. A very brief nod to many methodological and theoretical issues in research on meditation. We have long-term meditators versus novices, cross-sectional designs versus taking a group of individuals and looking at the effects of training. How long that duration of training is, how long the effects of the training are. Brandon King and Tony Zanesco are giving a talk on this today at four graduate students in our lab. Control groups, community, wait list, active controls. The closer you get an active control to the intent and quality of the meditator mindfulness intervention, the more the probability is that good things will come from your active control. So you then need another control group to look at the effects of repeated testing in addition. But active controls that are really a critical method that we have to embrace increasingly to understand the value-added nature of contemplative instructions above and beyond social support, group effects, and many demand characteristics. Randomized control designs don't assume that people have preferences. Variabilities of instructor qualification, their demeanor, their teacher effects, limitations of documenting formal and informal practice. How do you, I took a mindful breath, do I press a button? You know, it would kind of get a bit unwieldy. It's really important to study individual differences in terms of both the benefits and the potential liabilities of any intervention. And we can ask this interesting question. If we find differences over time, are those differences in skill or have we changed the context? Zindel yesterday was talking a lot about changing one's stance toward experience. That has a lot of implications for everything that arises in one's viscera, one's affect, and one's environment. And we can ask what component processes have been shifted by training. So there's a nice review article by Richie Davidson and Al Kazniak summarizing these methodological issues and more in The American Psychologist. We had a conference that touched on many of these issues, which at UC Davis that you can find online. And as for component processes, welcome to the cube. So over the last five years, I've had the incredible fortune to have a cabal of colleagues that uh, while we were not all in the same place except in cyberspace, for the most part. Um, Amishi Jha, John Dunn, and Antoine Lutz, and I have worked for quite a while on trying to conceptualize ways to think about the component processes involved in mindfulness training. And uh, the intent of this effort was to ask, using an approach 
drawing on lived experience, meditation instructions, and teaching from the Buddhist tradition, as well as current thinking in neuroscience, we ask, can we describe multiple dimensions of mental development that are supported by mindfulness practice? And our model has to be in terms that practitioners will recognize, so will psychologists and neuroscientists, religious studies scholars and mindfulness teachers, as well as corporate mindfulness training entities. A new category. <laughs> this model that I'm gonna talk about briefly, it's a heuristic, it is a teaching device. It is non-exhaustive, provisional, subject to refinement and reconfiguration. Enough disclaimers that this is, the map is not the territory, the model is not reality. So we start with a cube. That's why I call it the cube. We take some initial assumptions. The first is that we're going to engage in a practice in some physical posture. The second is that we're not being dragged or shackled to do the, process, the practice. We, we actually are entering into this voluntarily with a sense of acceptance, willingness, even curiosity. There's some ethical framework operating and there is some technique or task set that we want to accomplish during the time we engage in the practice. And we think of this cube in terms of three primary dimensions. The first is what we think of as being oriented on an object. If it's a breath awareness meditation and I'm focused on the sensations of the breath, then I'm highly object focused for the moment that I am actually noticing the tactile sensations. But if they come and go, over time, my object orientation is not so high. It doesn't have to be a physical object. Whenever you go wait for your luggage to arrive on the luggage belt, if you're in an airport, you are highly object oriented. Not mine, not mine, not mine. It's just not an object you can see. Second dimension we call de-reification. Zindel spent a lot of time talking about this idea of diffusion, decentering, coming to understand that your thoughts are not an accurate description of reality. They are phenomena that arise. One of the ways that chronic pain has been benefited by MBSR is by people de-reifying, catastrophizing thoughts. This will never end. I don't know when I'll feel better. Oh, why me? One can actually perceive those thoughts essentially as objects. So these are scales, these are dimensions, and we posit they're in the terms of the model locally orthogonal. They're on sort of separate axes. The third axis is meta-awareness, which has the quality of within the idea of being focused on an object or an audience. I have a background awareness of the timer. I have awareness of the task set. I'm able to report affective states in the presence of reporting physical details of perception. One of the things that is in background awareness is the task set itself. One can use meta-awareness to allow you to continuously monitor whether you're on the object or not. Meta-awareness is a complex dimension. I think we take three or four pages to talk about it in our paper, so I will refer you to more detail there. Each of the spaces, the points in this cube, can be associated with subsidiary qualities. One is a sense of aperture. I can have a focus on a candle flame and I have a narrow aperture like a camera, but I can have an instruction like, listen for the farthest sound. It's a wide aperture. We can think about a sense of mental clarity from feeling quite dull. I could be highly object oriented because I'm too tired to move. Stability is a quality which has 
what is the probability at the next time iteration that you're thinking about that you'll be in the same place in the model? It's also, Evan Thompson gave us this notion of in response to a perturbation, how far does any trajectory move from where you were and how quickly do you return? And there's a sense of subjective effort. With these seven dimensions, we can actually place mental states in the space. Addictive craving has very low dereification. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort to have an, a, a craving. You have a high clarity, and uh, it is uh, quite stable. We can think about mind wandering, low object orientation, low effort, very low stability, and middle clarity. And rumination has some effort because you are trying to suppress the rumination. You wish it would go away. But it unfortunately is all too clear. I woke up at 4.40 ruminating about the state of the world. But we can also put meditative states here. We can have a beginning focused attention, novice meditators expressing a high degree of subjective effort, some dereification, not much meta-awareness. Experts, more meta-awareness, less effort, more stability and more clarity. And of course, open monitoring practices, low object orientation, high meta-awareness, low effort for experts, and modest uh, decrease on that for novices. So this model lets us map expected outcomes of various practices, motivates the development of experimental designs and tasks relevant to the dimension. <clears throat> we can visualize potentially, in an ultimate sense, individual trajectories of development. Perhaps we should identify regions that might be no-fly zones. If you have low dereification and high meta-awareness, you may become fixed in awareness of sort of the mechanics of the fluctuation of your sensory system and have a sense of depersonalization. We don't know. But really, we did this to inspire further discussion of what we've left out. And you can read all about it and get a Jinsu knife if you check uh, the American Psychologist. And now this is available free without, you can get it online um, without having a library subscription. So now I want to talk in the remaining minutes about the Shamatha Project. So an overview of this long-term perennial many lifetime intensive research project that's been a work in progress for more than a decade. It's hard to believe that it's almost a decade since Alan Wallace taught two three-month full-time meditation retreats involving about six hours of meditation a day. We had two groups of 30 individuals and the age range was 20 to 70 years old. The primary training emphasis was on cultivating relaxation, stability of attention, perceptual clarity. Alan's The Attention Revolution is a kind of meditation manual for the project. And also, there was an emphasis on promoting beneficial attitudes towards self and others, the four measurables, compassion, loving kindness, empathetic joy, and equanimity. Our scientific goals were can training and focused attention and beneficial aspirations help train attention and emotion regulation? Are improvements in attention related to improved psychological function? What effects are the physiological changes that accompany these effects? How do qualitative analyses of retreatants' lived experience relate to findings in the laboratory? So we had two three-month retreats. We had a waitlist control design where we, in the spring of 2007, um, we began a three-month retreat, and we had a group of individuals who were matched on age, sex, meditation experience, ethnicity, that became random assigned, stratified by 
uh, by those factors, and we flew them to a retreat center to be tested just like the retreatants. The rest of the time, in between in these white spaces, they live their normal lives back home. And then they themselves, three months after the end of the first retreat, went on a second three-month retreat. We have follow-up assessments at five months, about six months, 15 months, and six to seven years. And believe it or not, we have greater than 80% retention at each of these follow-ups. The training emphasis, I've already said that it was relaxation, stability of attention, and perceptual clarity. And it was mindfulness of breathing, focusing on the flux of mental phenomena, settling the mind in its natural state and a kind of shamatha without a sign awareness of awareness. People did those at practices for about six hours a day and about 45 minutes a day, they uh, practiced the four measurables. So what do we think should happen? Well, you spend 800, 900 hours doing focused attention meditation, you should get a little better at focused attention. We expect that you should get better at executive control, at being able to res inhibit inappropriate responses. We think you should be able to increase your ability to engage with suffering when it arises in yourself and others, that all-important first question I mentioned. Ultimately, what we're hoping for, what we're hoping the data points to, is an increase in pro-social tendencies. So we kind of had a long time to get this project going. We spent three years thinking about it, so we kind of made a kitchen sink of kitchen sinks. Uh, many different uh, tasks. I'm not going to talk about uh, all of these in my very limited time. I'm just going to touch on some attention-related data, some emotion-related data, and a bit about uh, how we look at structured interviews. This was a multidisciplinary and multi-method study. So we have EEG measures, we have autonomic measures, we have performance measures, EMG startle, we have facial expressions of emotion, thematic analysis, biochemical analysis. So it's a village this project, and I'm deeply, deeply indebted to so many people who've participated uh, in uh, the project over the last uh, many years. And there are four graduate students who are here at the meeting, uh, Quinn Conklin, Brandon King, Aliyah Squara, and Tony Zanesco. And um, this project would not have existed without extraordinary generous support over the years from uh, the Hershey Family Foundation, which has, it would not have come to be without uh, their continued support. The Fetzer Institute, John Templeton, and many donors, anonymous and otherwise. So let's go to Colorado, to Red Feather Lakes, Colorado, in Poudre Canyon. And here is the meditation lodge at the Shambhala Mountain Center that we took over for this project. Here is a meditation hall. Here is Alan Wallace teaching in it, in the second retreat. Downstairs from there, there was a nice dorm room that became a perfect space for two state-of-the-art 96-channel EEG laboratories. This was what the subject room looked like. Here's our unobtrusive video camera when you, <laughs> when you, when you cover it with the speaker and turn the lights down way low. You can't see it. This was the control room. Here's somebody um, all hooked up and nowhere to go. Let's talk about um, some of our attention results. And I'm going to focus now on the work of uh, Tony Zanesco and his dissertation work. If you're going to work that hard to practice focused attention meditation, we need to make a very boring task to see how well your attention is. So this, is, this was the dissertation work of Catherine McQueen. We start with a dot, and you're going to see a line for about a tenth of a second. And the line goes away, 
and about two seconds later, you see another line, and it might be short. And you push a button when you see the short line in the version of this task that's for vigilance, and you withhold the pushing a button when the version of this task that is about response inhibition. But 90% of the time, it's not a short line. So for the response inhibition component, most of what you're doing is just pushing the button, and when you think you see a shorter line, you withhold. But in point of fact, this is so that you understand the task. This is what it actually looks like. We spend about 15 minutes making the short line longer and longer and longer until you can't tell if it's long or short, and so we then back off just a tad so that only at 75% of the time can you tell if it's long or short. That's defined as your visual perceptual threshold. So now that you barely can tell if it's long or short, we say for the next 32 minutes with no commercial breaks, <laughs> please engage in this task. So we've done this. This is sort of like Listerine, the task. I love this task, but it's the task participants love to hate. Um, this is uh, from a manuscript that's under review from uh, Tony Zanesco, and also there's a paper in Emotion 2011 by Belginder Sadra and others. So this is a graph of um, a measure of perceptual sensitivity on this task across eight four-minute blocks, the full 32 minutes, for the response inhibition condition in the second retreat that includes data from follow-up across the seven years. And what you can see is that if the black lines, this is your typical decrement over time, people, performance falls off. But halfway through the retreat, the black dashed line, there's a significant flattening of that downward slope. And there's even further sustenance of the flatness of that slope at post-test, after the retreat, but there's no significant difference between um, mid and post. But what's really interesting is that six months later, the dash dot, dash dot line, and two years later, there's a maintenance of this um, improvement. That maintenance is not present seven years later. We also have found that for an, on an individual basis, to the degree that individuals improved on this task, they also, it, that improvement predicted self-reported adaptive psychological functioning as a latent construct from combining many different self-report measures. We also looked, Tony looked at the reaction time coefficient of variation. And what he finds is that at the beginning of the retreat, dot dash, dot dash, black, there's a high, higher re variability of your reaction time trial by trial, and that decreases at the midpoint and at post, but does not sustain in the follow-up. He also modeled the impact of meditation practice on age, and so these are model estimates of whether you practiced a lot of meditation since the retreat or not. That's within this range of 1,250 to 2,750 hours after the retreat, predicting for a younger group or an older group the maintenance of this advantage. In the gray lines, a group age 45, this is modeled from the model statistical data, it's 10 years younger than the middle, than the mean age of the group. There's no impact on whether you meditate a lot or a little in terms of your performance across seven years. But if you're older, those who meditated the most maintain the most. Those who meditated less had a decrement in their response. So there's an interaction 
between age and practice in the maintenance of the benefits of the retreat. Now, this is funny. We collected these EEG data almost a decade ago, and I'm going to tell you they're a week old. So this is the global field power of the evoked potential, the event-related potential, the tiny brainwave perturbations elicited by these stimuli, taking into consideration all of our 88 electrodes. It's called the global field power, and it's a complex waveform because we actually have a 100 millisecond little mask that comes on, then we have the line, and then we have the mask coming on, and then the mask going off. So we have this kind of complex visual staccato presentation. And these are responses in retreat two. In response, this is blue is pre, and green and red are mid and post. And what we did is a running t-test between the conditions, essentially not a t-test, a one-way ANOVA between all three conditions. And as long as 25 milliseconds of time was significantly different at every single contiguous time point, we designated this as a significant difference in the electrocortical activity as a function of pre, mid, and post retreat. And what's interesting, even though these are correct rejections, this is every time you are responding, you find that there is a shift in the electrocortical activity that's associated with training. I cannot interpret that in terms of brain regions. We have just begun to explore these data. But what's really interesting is if you look at the hits when you withhold, there's a really remarkable, um, particularly in this sort of four, 350 to 450 after the line goes off, there's a huge impact of the training in terms of the electrocortical activity that's involved coincident with the impulse to withhold. So we presume that this is evidence of some kind of perhaps frontally mediated inhibit inhibition in response to the discrimination that it's not a, short, a long line, it's a short line, it's a target. So now I'm gonna show you uh, Spirit Rock Meditation Center, where we've also begun to investigate uh, the impacts of retreat experience. This is in um, West Marin County in Cal Northern California, a very beautiful place. Here's a meditation hall. And we looked at one month retreatants. Here's their uh, dorm where they sleep when they're on retreat. And we developed a laboratory in a box. So we had uh, 16 laptop computers that we could set outside when people are in silence with a self-instruction manual. Here's Catherine McLean being a model for how you set up your little monk cell with our laptop. And we replicate this improvement in response inhibition. This is um, in the... Um, Gray Line, a meditation community, um, meditation group that is matched in meditation experience to the retreat group at uh, before and after one month testing. The darker line is the pre-retreat values. You see the gray line falls off. That's the control group at the second testing. And the black line sustains this benefit. And we also replicate in the retreat group, the black line shows lower reaction time variability. So something about engaging in this practice under the conditions of retreat makes the system more stable moment to moment. I also want to tell you as a shout out to Quinn Conklin, who's giving a talk on Sunday. We looked at telomere length. This is in collaboration with Alyssa Epple and Ju Lin and Liz Blackburn and a group at UCSF. We find that three weeks at Spirit Rock increases your telomere length. However, we don't know what happens three weeks of coming back home. <laughs> she will tell you all about this and some very interesting relations between personality and whose telomeres get longer and whose don't. 
So come to her talk. Sunday. So let's, in the remaining few minutes, talk about responses to negative emotional stimuli. This is work highlighted, the dissertation work of Brandon King. So I'm going to show you some unpleasant images. So that was the warning. This is a picture viewing task where people are going to see pictures from the International Affective Picture Set at the beginning and end of the retreat. We did not want to do this in the middle of the retreat because if you present a horrible slide of something and you're in the middle of a retreat, there's not much going on to take it out of mind. So there's unstructured picture viewing of a six second picture, then there's about a 15 second gap and then another picture. We have uh, counterbalance sets of 72 images that are matched on valence and arousal and it's in the context of a, a startle paradigm. So here are some images of suffering and distress and we tried to make thematic matching of content for to be shown so that you only see a given picture once. Here are images of threat and violence. So one of the dependent measures that we look at is heart rate deceleration. Because heart rate deceleration actually is a measure of essentially attentional engagement with the stimulus. And it's a physiological marker that indexes enhanced perceptual processing to novel stimuli. Cardiac deceler deceleration in response to others' suffering predicts increased likelihood of prosocial behavior. And phasic heart rate decreases are associated with subjective experiences of compassion. So this is what we find in the control group this blue line is the duration of the pictures. If we are looking at the cardiac deceleration in the control group, there is no difference between pre and post, between dashed and solid, but there is a valence difference of suffering versus threat. So in the control group, there's increased cardiac deceleration to the threat stimuli relative to the stimuli of suffering. Can you see that? In the retreat group, there is initially, there is again less of a response at the beginning of the retreat to images of suffering compared to threat. That's this very significant difference in this arrow here. But after training, there's no difference between the response to threat and the response to suffering. So we did a long-term follow-up using this sort of mail a computer to turn people's house into a little laboratory. Um, this is a remarkable fact that we were able to get 73% participation in this part of the follow-up. And here we're going to look at 21 people who only saw these images once. Folks in retreat two saw the images twice, and so we're not talking about them right now. So we, they unpack their little computer, they set themselves up. And so we, Brandon created a self-paced recognition task, a free viewing period, full screen on the laptop of these images. Then he rated the affect that was aroused by viewing these images. There was a recognition judgment. Did you see these images uh, in the past? Or is it a new image? Remember, we're asking people about their memory for seeing an image seven years ago, one time for six seconds. And what's your confidence in that memory? There were 10 images per category set. So he created, these are these lovely pictures, and um, he found sort of matching novel images to an image so that we can have the same thematic content uh, as uh, the old images. Here. 
We did give some pleasant pictures. I'm not presenting data about much pleasant uh, stuff today. But I wanted to give you a break. <laughs> so we can look at cats, puppies, and butterflies. <laughs> In fact, maybe we should just stop here. <laughs> so what Brandon found is that, interestingly, there's no difference in how long you look at pictures, if they were pleasant or threat-related, whether they were old or new, but novel images of suffering popped out. So there's something about suffering. In addition, there was an increased accuracy for suffering relative in terms of, yes, I saw it before. And this is 50% line, you know, I didn't see it, I did see it, that would be chance accuracy. So people perform above chance, but they perform significantly better for the memory of images of suffering. But there's no um, difference, I want to point out, whether you saw that image at the beginning of your retreat or at the end of your retreat. But this is pretty wild, what I'm about to show you. This is the cardiac deceleration for images of suffering if you've forgotten them. Whether they were presented at the beginning, in dash, or at the end of your retreat. But if, you, if they were presented at the end of the retreat, images you forgot don't differ uh, from the ones that were presented at the beginning of the retreat. But if the image came at the end of the retreat, there is a, they were associated with much more cardiac deceleration if you remembered them. So what this is saying is that even though there was no recognition accuracy difference, the physiological response to the images of suffering at the end of the retreat is very different than the response to suffering at the beginning of the retreat. And I kind of want to think about that, like the fabric of your capacity to be impacted by the suffering has changed. The same type of stimulus has more physiological impact at the end of the training. And this is something to think about in terms of Often when people come out of retreats, those of you who've done retreats, you know that there is this kind of rawness, this vulnerability. The world comes at you in very intense ways. For threat, there's no relationship. There's a remembered stimuli, whether they happened at the beginning or the end of the retreat, doesn't matter in terms of differentiating the arousal but it's the same kind of finding. If you remember them, they were associated with more physiological um, cardiac deceleration when you were encoding the stimuli. Interestingly, this is a graph that shows a high degree of relatedness between the average deceleration to all the images of suffering for a given individual and their overall accuracy for memory. The people who showed the strongest cardiac deceleration to images of suffering actually have the best performance. Brandon should be around, so you can ask him to explain more of this to you. Putting these two sets of findings together, perhaps I can conjecture the following. Evidence of improvements in response inhibition consider the possibility that one of the things one learns to inhibit is the quick tendency to avoid or disengage from triggers of difficult emotion. Teachers speak about being with your suffering, not just, you know, maybe going and entertaining yourself out of it. Considering the consequences of increased salience of images of suffering, both over training and in the long term, these may reflect a shift in the priority of and capacity for empathic concern. 
Finally, in the remaining two minutes, I want to just briefly remind you of an image that you have been seeing all week or over the last few days, this great graphic by Mind and Life graphic artist Kristen Adelson. Why I'm showing you this now is because it represents a kind of way of understanding phenomena that are interrelated by using network analysis and graph theory. And we can visualize many different kinds of processes in terms of nodes and connections between nodes. And we can have communities. And uh, those communities here are of this color. And then we have other uh, less affiliated individuals. So there are a lot of basic points about graph theory and network analysis implicitly embedded in this image that you've been looking at all week. We can use analytic techniques in our qualitative approach. This is the work of Jen Picorni, Alex Norman, Tony Zanesco, Susan bauer -Wu is our esteemed collaborator in Baljinder Sadra. And we did um, interviews. Baljinder Sadra conducted in situ interviews in the second retreat um, nine years ago. And many of the questions we asked, this one is about your approach to life. How would you describe or summarize your current perspective or approach to life? including your goals, priorities, and everyday activities. And we can take a piece of text. Here, it's sort of individually coded in little sections that occur in time. And this is a very brief uh, description of pulling out some themes that are in this text. Yeah, we have an open and nice view. I can have a special room only for meditation. So in many ways, I think that if it's possible to achieve shamatha in a partially active way of life, then I think I can do it. And if I can do it, then it'll be great for many people. So we can look at what themes are going on here. And we can turn those themes into a network. Well, we have you know, 30 people in that retreat. And we have three time points. So just as a teaser. Here is a, a network uh, description of the themes in response to this question at the end of the retreat for six individuals overlaid. And we have a, a paper. Hopefully, it will be in press any day. And uh, you can see how we do this work. But it's going to be a way that we can visualize and extract quantitative metrics of things like page rank and network centrality and weighted degree. These are all terms for network analytic methods that we will enable to a relationship between qualitative data relating to people's lived experience and how they interpreted the training and our quantitative measures. And with that, I'm done. So we have about seven minutes for questions. We'll ask people to step up to the mic. And if you have, we're going to ask you to take your questions very concise. And if you have more than one question, take your top question. Just ask one. And if you have to, uh, you can ask turn the house up full here so we see each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't see a whole lot of data on controls. Um, from people who have no interest or back or background in meditation. I'm sorry. I have I did not see a whole lot of information on controls, control groups, uh, testing, especially in the first parts, but in all of it. So, uh, so there were two. So everybody in the project for the Shamatha project were long-term meditators who had done at least three retreats, and so they were all. The the control group was created by creating randomly from a group of 60 people uh, two groups of 30. But they were all from the same self-selected small population that exactly. wanted. Exactly. So did you so have there controls? Is no, so our control group in this context is a longitudinal comparison or a weightless comparison, either of individuals when they're not in retreat compared to when they are. So you had no controls from the general population? Is, or is that available in the literature, so, so, these kinds so, of tests? So there, the general population, you can't take a 
general population person and put them in a three-month retreat? No, I mean in terms of the tests that you perform. Oh, prior so we to have retreat. we have so we piloted data and community samples. So we're doing this within this group longitudinally, okay. and different age groups. You know, college kids might do better than older folks uh, who are. You know, we we've not we piloted the tasks to get them ex to work, but we have not collected extensive data on um, control groups, though in Catherine McLean's 2009 Attention Perception and Performance or Psychophysics paper, um, there where the attention tasks are described, that's a normative population of undergraduates. Okay, thank you. Hello, yeah. hi. Um, I just had a quick question. I, I think I'm confused a little bit about this deceleration uh, of the heart rate compared to um, thinking about another study with Richie Davidson, I think Matthew Ricard, looking at um, images of suffering and the increase in the amygdala and the rapidity in the return to baseline is a measure of resiliency but not avoiding experience and further hearing about larger amygdala relevant to altruistic people. I don't think we're at, I don't think it's different, but I'm a little confused about the decelerated heart rate and your outcomes looking at, we want to be able to be able to, uh, to approach suffering and to uh, not be reactive in suffering. Can you help me out? Um, so this, this autonomic psychophysiological measure is yeah. a rapid initial response to an encounter with a novel stimulus. So it's actually an indirect measure of attentional engagement and processing. And so there's no direct way to go, I mean, maybe Richie has done a study where simultaneously in the same individuals, they've related the time course of the amygdala fMRI signal with a given individual's psychophysiological response measured in the magnet at the same time. But there, there is, I'm not really clear on on what my question is? On, the, on what, what the, conf the question is. Yeah, I, I'm looking at, I see the outcome that you are seeing is that we want to be able to approach suffering, yeah? Engage, we want to engage with, with suffering. And what that engage with means? Yes. May not be approach and may not be avoid. Okay, okay. The Either only dimension, that's, that's, the very I, Zen answer, but a Zen I, answer. I, I don't a, think a, that approach avoid are the only dimensions. Yeah, I understand. Of engage, of, I of think it. more to the point is that to not begin to view meditation as a way, as Judith was pointing uh, us toward bypassing, that we actually want to be fully human and experiencing, so that's absolutely our but not view. reactive. So, so we could spend a long time talking I'm sorry. about what reaction. Yeah, yeah. I just got confused we, about a measure of decreasing heart rate and thinking about other studies of increase amygdala activation but of poor it, amygdala. But not the same measure. Exactly. I understand. I'll talk okay. later. Thank you. Sure. So I'm not positive that I fully grasp the, the slide, but there was one slide about age difference yeah. where there was a line that showed an increase, I think, for people who practiced longer compared yep. to people who didn't continue to practice as much over those seven years, was it showing that? Yeah, so what that was is a model estimate based on all the variability of the data that, that we found an age by practice interaction. So older people who practiced more meditation had less of a fall off in their long-term follow-up response inhibition performance. So what that graph showed is that if you were, you know, given the variability of the data and the statistical model of the results, if you were 45 years old, you know, modeling these things as a kind of continuum, the space created by being 45 years old, it doesn't matter much if you meditated or not, your maintenance was essentially stable. But if you were older, you found, we found more improvement with more meditation, less 
loss of the impact of training. So it's sort of in this general model of it, the older you get, you're, you know, as things begin to be more challenging, there may be a protective effect of more practice. Did you look at the, because I wasn't sure from that slide, the importance of continuing practice in order to sustain the effect Sort That's of period, the period, not the difference between 45 and 65, but yeah. how much of a difference did how much practice make? Because I know the, that's been the question that's been raised in various discussions with Richie recently. Well, you can find Tony about the statistical model and what we can know from our data. We have a very messy figure that shows every single individual across the seven years, and you can look at the variability in, as a function of meditation practice and time and performance. Thank you. Thanks, Cliff. Great talk. <clears throat> um, so I think, you know, one of the phenomena that we see again and again in science is the formation of communities um, around a new research question. And then as those communities blossom, they become bigger. Um, but the core nucleus of early researchers can often establish um, a bias or um, a social relationship that can then lead to either erroneous or biased conclusions and research approaches. Sure. Um, this is, you know, this goes back, we've seen this most recently in the replicability crisis in social, social psychology, in some mm. respects in neuroscience, but it goes back as far as gravity. Mm. Is the formation of this kind of social relationship a concern for bias in the research in the research community in contemplative science? If so, how can we avoid that? And, I don't think we can avoid bias. I think we can work to mitigate its pernicious effects in promoting um, overall erroneous conclusions. And I believe that the answer to that is a multi-tiered effort that includes the Open Science Initiative, where one's data sets are made freely available, and you know, the, the creation of structures where there's a kind of hive uh, nature, and that impacts the sociology of science and career building and your own data set hegemony, and you know, when is one done to release stuff to the world? But there's also, we need to mitigate a sense that this, this is always good, you know, that we wanna, we wanna validate something as opposed to just ask the simple question, what happens when you do this? So then I, ha I have a follow-up question to that, which is, um, you know, we may have seen a bit of that kind of community response to an outsider perspective in uh, the response to the Krieg Olsen work in, on the Nepalese monks. Um, the little bit of giggling from the back of the room. How do we avoid um, the, these very well-intentioned and meaningful and important questions about context um, and culture? from becoming barriers to entry to new researchers in the field and to new entrants. I would tell you to focus your efforts on including context in your research questions. Okay, thanks, Cliff. Great talk. Okay, Judith. Good, yes, thank you, Cliff, so much for your presentation. My question is about the later replication of the uh, practice situation at Shambhala Mountain Center, which was a group practice situation in a spirit rock environment where people were practicing alone. And I'm wondering if there were things that would indicate that there's a difference between a three-month practice in solitary setting versus group practice settings, and whether there were things that indicated some difference in the response and the uh, experience of the people who were solitary yogis and yoginis as opposed to group practitioners. So it, it's a wonderful question. I wish we had an N of 300 and we could pull out, you know, and then it would be a 100-year project, not a decade long. Um, in the Shambhala Mountain Center, it's true that people were on their own schedule as agreed with Alan as their teacher mentor. But twice a day, they spent over an hour and a half in the, in the morning, and, in, and they had an evening sitting and a Dharma talk in a small room, and it's only 30 people. 
So you have to weigh six hours in your room alone, meals together, and twice a day you have on the order of two hours with a small room with 30 individuals compared to, a, and, and it was not a strict noble silence. Uh. Alan suggested that if you talk a little bit, you should observe the consequences of your speech. The impact of silence as an intervention is unstudied and Very profound. Interesting. Very interesting. What meditation is compared to the environmental, behavioral, radical change of a retreat, I do not know. So hopefully we'll study that. Some, Thank you very much. Another one of these context questions. Thank you so much. <laughs>